reporter John Minnell has been speaking to another uh, war photojournalist, highly respected, who worked in Vietnam, Philip Jones Griffiths. You have been described as one of the most respected photographers in the world. What's the one picture that you took in Vietnam which had the greatest lasting impact on you? There's a picture I've taken. It's a very simple picture, but it's of a woman who's actually been shot in the head. She's bandaged. Her hand is up to her face. Today, as the war in Vietnam assumes the status of a nagging memory, other conflicts draw the crusading attention of a new generation of war photographers. But since the declaration of the war on terror, censorship has become an even bigger issue. ...ideas are quite different in the way you might execute them. So that's kind of your, your broad idea. And then, yeah, how do you break it down into something tangible? The photojournalism course at the School of Documentary Photography at Newport is regarded by many as the best in the world. Started in the 70s by Magnum photographer David Hearn, it still has strong links with the agency. One of the successful graduates of the course is war photographer Anastasia Taylor Lind, who has returned to teach seminars at the college. This image by Anastasia won the Guardian Photography Competition. Anastasia's subject is the female units of the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, who were engaged in a sustained and bloody conflict with Turkey over a Kurdish homeland. And as with Philip Jones Griffiths, access is everything. Of course, the amazing thing about his work in Vietnam is the access and his determination to keep going back and documenting the same issues. Um, it, would it be possible today in Iraq Probably not. On her latest visit to photograph the Kurds, Anastasia also filmed a video diary. First, she has a perilous journey north toward the frontier with Turkey, where the PKK guerrillas operate. From here, they carry out cross-border incursions to attack Turkish military targets. Hopefully I'll be there soon, and then I'll feel really relaxed and fine, but so far, things, um, not too nervous. As with Philip Jones Griffiths before, the photographer is not welcome. Turkey sees the PKK as a terrorist organization and profoundly disapproves of the way she portrays them. It's, uh... Almost six o'clock in the morning here at the logistics camp on the morning of my third day in Iraq. And behind me, you can see um, the friends are just saddling up a mule. We're going to our final destination now, where I have permission to photograph a, um, a camp about half an hour, half an hour's walk away. Kurdistan um, covers four countries Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. And in all of those countries, the Kurdish minority is oppressed and persecuted because of their cultural heritage. Under Saddam Hussein, the Kurds were the most persecuted of all the Iraqi people. <laughs> Whilst the world watched in horror, Saddam massacred the Kurds in northern Iraq. But few people, if any, knew that Turkey had an equally violent approach to its own Kurdish population. Modern Turkey was founded on the notion of Turkishness. So everyone in Turkey must be Turkish. And of course, that doesn't sit with the Kurds who have their own language, their own history, their own culture. Turkish government commits huge human rights abuses against the Kurdish people. In the southeast of Turkey, Kurdish is not allowed to be taught at schools. Kurdish people are not allowed to give their children Kurdish names on their birth certificates. Um, it's very difficult for the Kurdish people to form a political party. And that's where some of these issues with the PKK arise. If you don't give people a political voice, then what other options are you giving them? If people don't have a democratic right and they feel trapped, and they've become desperate.
Kurdish society is patriarchal and male-dominated, so the female fighters are additionally challenging the traditional values of their culture. This aspect of the conflict is of particular interest to Anastasia. Women make up approximately one third of the PKK guerrilla army. And what's really exceptional um, about these women is that um, they've come from a very traditional patriarchal village society often where women really are worthless. They are experiencing more freedom than they've ever had in their lives before. They experience in the mountains, in their guerrilla units, true democracy. Um, they're able to, to live as equals to men, which, you know, would never, would never have been the case if they had stayed in their villages or their towns. It's the femininity of these fighters that captures the photographer's eye. Initially, that was difficult because they didn't do anything outwardly feminine. They didn't wear nail polish, uh, they didn't wear makeup, you know, those things that become very visual in terms of photography. And this woman started combing her hair in the woods one morning as she was getting ready. Um, I knew that in terms of content, that was something that I needed to have a picture of. Women all over the world uh, brush their hair when they get up in the mornings. You know, it's something that we all do. Um, and again, I think it's a picture that, that makes these women look normal. She's very passionate about the people that she photographs, and, and I think that is one of the kind of defining things about her, that she does have passion for these people. Obviously, when she's there, she kind of lives that lifestyle. Um, there's no hierarchy in terms of comforts, for example. So she understands clearly the suffering that they may be suffering. There are dangers in getting so emotionally involved, particularly as the PKK are considered by many, including the UK government, as terrorists. Now, in 2008, it's more important than ever to understand terrorism and to understand why people commit acts of terrorism. More important than any other time in our history. Why does somebody commit acts of terrorism? What, what has happened to them in their life to make them do that? <laughs> Whilst some photographers might parachute into a situation and move on after a couple of days to the next theatre of war, for Anastasia, this is an ongoing project. Long term, she will be returning to capture these people's lives, and this adds another layer to her images. This is Ashti. She's, she was five at the time I took this picture, and this is her sister Shafak. It was the first time that these sisters had met since Shafak joined the guerrillas when she was 14. She ran away in the middle of the night without telling her mother. So Ashti came to the mountains with her mother, believing that Shafak had been killed in the fighting. And they looked for her in several camps and couldn't find her anyway, anywhere. Um, and just as they were leaving, they mo moved through this camp where we were and they found Shafak by chance. So this is the first morning that the sisters have met. The first thing Ashti did when she came into the room was she ran over and she took Shafak's Kalashnikov and she said, I want to hold it, I want to hold it. And so Shafak came and helped her hold the gun. And I've since been back to visit Ashti. She's seven now. I took the magazine with me. It's amazing to be able to, for the first time really, to be able to show the people in my pictures how it had been published. And she was delighted. She, couldn't, she carried the magazine round till it was completely tattered and dogged, showing all her friends. This was problematic for the PKK commanders because they worried that if the photograph was taken out of context, um, people might think that the PKK were using child soldiers. Of course, that's not the case. Um, and I would never allow this picture to be used in that context. Uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been difficult. They weren't, you know, they weren't happy about it being used. The PKK themselves are alert to the power of photography. They issue all personnel with a photo ID. And in turn, some of these images are used to iconize them as martyrs if they die in battle. 
This image was compared by David Bailey to the familiar iconic image of Che Guevara taken by Alberta Corda, as seen on posters and t-shirts the world over. This picture perhaps is predominantly about how she wants to be represented. I think she has very much ownership over the portrait. It's very simple, it's very straightforward, but I think it tells the viewer quite a lot about this woman. But ultimately it probably tells the viewer something about how I see her as well. I hugely admire her. Um, I think she's beautiful and wonderful and amazing. Um, and I have a huge amount of respect for her, so I think that naturally comes through in the pictures. I want my pictures to question people's perceptions and, and preconceptions of what a terrorist 